On June 13th, 2015, I was invited to join the Bohemian Club. At first, I thought it was just a cool, exclusive club for hot shots and powerful people. I was dead wrong. What I experienced at Bohemian Grove changed me forever. For the safety of myself and others, I will not mention anyone by their real name. But the people who participated are people you know and see on the big screen all the time. In the dim light of my cluttered living room, the envelope looked almost otherworldly. It was thick, with a texture that spoke of a time when communication was an art form, not a convenience. The seal on the back, a stylized owl, felt ominous. I turned the envelope over in my hands, pondering how it found its way to me. At the time, I was an upcoming prominent Hollywood actor. The invitation inside was short, offering no clue as to who had sent it or why. It simply extended an invitation to the Bohemian Club for a two-week retreat at the Bohemian Grove promising rejuvenation and networking with the elite of the elite. The Grove was a legend in its own right, a place of power where the world's most influential figures gathered in secrecy. Curiosity sealed my decision. I would go to the Bohemian Grove unaware that I was stepping into a narrative far removed from the Hollywood tales of redemption I had hoped to emulate. The journey to Monte Rio was a silent one. My driver, a man of few words, navigated the winding roads with a familiarity that suggested he had made this trip many times before. The towering redwoods seemed to close in around us as we drove, their ancient presence both awe-inspiring and unsettling. Upon arrival, the gates of the Bohemian Grove opened as if by magic revealing a world that was at once captivating and intimidating. The air was filled with the sounds of nature and strange piano music in the background, a stark contrast to the constant hum of LA. I was escorted to my accommodations, a rustic yet surprisingly comfortable cabin nestled among the trees. The sense of isolation was immediate and profound. Here, Surrounded by the untouched beauty of the forest, the outside world felt like a distant memory. The grove was everything I had heard, and more. A place where the powerful and famous mingled with an ease that spoke of long-established connections. I was an outsider, yet the novelty of my presence seemed to amuse the other guests. They welcomed me into their conversations sharing stories and insights with a candor that alcohol often inspires. It was during one of these evenings, as the fire crackled and the shadows danced among the redwoods, that I first heard whispers of the grove's darker traditions. Cremation of the care, they called it, a ritual that was both a bonding experience and a rite of passage for the members. The details were vague, shrouded in mystery in the bottom of too many glasses of wine. Yet, the way it was mentioned, with a mix of reverence and fear, piqued my interest. My inquiries were met with evasive answers and changing subjects, a clear indication that this was a topic not open for discussion with newcomers. It was then that I met Edward, a member whose eyes held stories he seemed reluctant to share. He was older, his demeanor marked by an elegance that spoke of a different era. We connected over shared memories of Hollywood, a bond that seemed to ease the caution with which he approached our conversation. Be careful, he warned me one evening as we walked along a moonlit path. The Grove is not just a place for relaxation and business, There are traditions here, ancient and powerful. Not all are meant for the eyes of the uninitiated. His words, spoken with a seriousness that bordered on fear, stayed with me. Or was this cremation of care? And why did it evoke such a reaction in those who had presumably witnessed it? 
The days leading up to the ceremony were filled with a tension that was almost palpable. The laughter and camaraderie that had marked the early days of the retreat seemed to give way to a collective anticipation or perhaps apprehension of what was to come. I saw less of Edward, and when our paths did cross, his warnings grew more urgent. You don't understand what you're dealing with, he told me, his voice low. This is not a game, not some Hollywood spectacle. The fire consumes, and not just the physical. Be wary of the flames, my friend. His cryptic messages only fueled my determination to uncover the truth. I could not shake the feeling that there was something more, something hidden beneath the surface of the camaraderie and the ancient rituals. The Bohemian Grove was a place of power, yes, but at what cost? What was the price of admission to this most exclusive of clubs? As the night of the cremation of care approached, I felt a mix of excitement and dread. I was about to witness something few outside the grove had ever seen. A ritual that bound these men together in ways I could not yet understand. I thought of Edward's warnings, of the fear in his eyes, and wondered if I was making a mistake. But it was too late for second thoughts. The night had arrived, and with it, a sense of inevitability that I could not escape. I was about to step into the heart of the Bohemian Grove's darkness, unaware of the price I would pay for my curiosity. As I made my way to the designated meeting point, the forest seemed alive, the ancient redwoods witnesses to rituals old as time. I was about to become part of that history, for better or for worse. As the days peeled away, the initial sheen of the Bohemian Grove began to tarnish under the weight of its own secrecy. The laughter that once seemed genuine now carried an edge of nervousness, and the shadows among the ancient trees grew longer with each passing day. I found myself caught between the desire to belong and the growing unease that Edward's warnings had planted in my heart. The grove's daily rhythm was a strange mix of leisurely activities and hushed, hurried meetings that took place in secluded corners of the vast property. Despite the outward appearance of relaxation, there was a palpable undercurrent of seriousness to the proceedings. It was clear that the real business of the grove was conducted away from prying eyes, and I was not privy to it. Edward became an enigmatic figure during these days, appearing suddenly at my side during walks or meals, each time offering more veiled warnings about the nature of the grove and its ceremonies. You see the surface, he would say, his gaze drifting to the other members, but not the depths. Beware what lurks beneath. His cryptic advice only served to deepen my resolve. I began to pay closer attention to the interactions around me, noting the coded language and the significant looks that passed between members. It was a world of unspoken agreements and decisions made in the cover of darkness. The anticipation for the ceremony built with each day. It was spoken of in reverent tones, a cornerstone of the grove's traditions, yet details remained elusive. The more I asked, the more I was met with silence or deflection. It was clear that this was something I had to see for myself, to understand the true nature of the bond that held these men together. One evening, as the sky bled into the deep blues and purples of twilight, I found myself at the edge of a gathering. The men spoke of the ceremony with a fervor that bordered on religious zeal their faces alight with an intensity that was almost fanatic. It's a cleansing, one murmured, a release from the burdens we carry. Another nodded, adding, it binds us, forges us anew in the flames. Their words sent a chill down my spine, 
and I retreated into the shadows, unseen. That night, I lay awake in my cabin, the darkness pressing in around me. Edward's warnings echoed in my mind, a litany of caution that I could no longer ignore. What was I about to witness? And more importantly, what would it demand of me? The days leading up to the ceremony were a blur of apprehension and second-guessing. I saw less and less of Edward, and when I did, he seemed a ghost of himself, his usual poise replaced by a jittery tension. His final warning was a whisper, be ready, the fire reveals all. As the day of the ceremony dawned, the grove was alive with a nervous energy. The usual activities were abandoned, as preparations for the evening took precedence. I could feel the anticipation in the air, a tangible force that seemed to suffocate all other emotions. I spent the day in a daze, my thoughts consumed by what the night would bring. As the sun began to set, painting the sky in shades of fire, I dressed in the robes that had been provided to me, the fabric heavy on my shoulders. A knock on my door signaled it was time to join the procession to the ceremony site. The walk to the clearing was silent, a procession of shadows moving through the twilight. The grove's members, once so vibrant and full of life, now seemed like spectres, their faces obscured by the hoods of their robes. I felt a sense of isolation, a profound loneliness that was at odds with the crowd that surrounded me. As we arrived at the clearing, the sight that greeted us was otherworldly. Torches lined the space, casting flickering shadows that danced across the faces of the assembled members. At the center of the clearing was a man, naked with his hands and feet tied. He wiggled, trying to break free and desperately trying to scream but couldn't because of the cloth stuffed in his mouth. I was shocked. Why was there a man naked on the ground? It has to just be a ceremonial thing, right? The air was heavy with the scent of pine and something else. Something funky. The ceremony began with a chant, a low, monotonous drone that seemed to rise from the very earth itself. The members formed a circle around the man, their voices joining in a crescendo that filled the night. I stood at the edge of the clearing, an observer to this ancient rite, my heart pounding in my chest. As the chanting reached its peak, they poured liquid over him. At first I thought it was water, as a sign of rebirth. But then, in an instant, the man was set ablaze. The fire roared to life, the man's wiggling intensified and his muffled screams pierced me like a knife. The heat was intense and I could feel the sweat beading on my brow, the light blinding after the darkness of the forest and after a minute he was silent, dead. The faces of the men around me in the firelight, their expressions were transformed a light with a fervor that bordered on ecstasy. It was a moment of pure, unbridled release, a shedding of the masks they wore in the outside world, and then, as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. The fire died down, leaving only embers and the charred remains of the corpse. The members began to disperse, their voices subdued as if the act of witnessing the ceremony had changed them in some fundamental way. I stood alone in the clearing, the smoke curling lazily into the night sky. Edward's words came back to me, a warning that now felt like a prophecy. The fire reveals all. I had witnessed the cremation of care. The morning after the ceremony, the grove seemed to breathe a collective sigh of relief, as if the very trees had been holding their breath, awaiting the outcome of the night's events. The air felt charged, heavy 
with the remnants of the ritual that had unfolded under the cloak of darkness. I awoke, feeling as though I had crossed an invisible threshold, stepping into a realm that was not meant for the likes of me. Breakfast was a muted affair, the usual banter replaced by introspective silence. Glances were exchanged, loaded with an unspoken understanding that I could not decipher. I felt more isolated than ever, an outsider who had witnessed too much yet understood too little. It was then that I realized Edward was absent. His usual seat lay empty, his absence a gaping hole in the fabric of the morning routine. A sense of foreboding settled over me, a dark cloud that no amount of sunlight could dispel. I sought him out, driven by a need to understand, to find some semblance of sanity in the madness that the grove seemed to breed. My inquiries were met with evasive answers and shrugs of indifference. It was as if Edward had vanished, erased from the collective memory of the grove. Panic began to claw at my insides, a relentless beast that refused to be silenced. The warnings, the ceremony, Edward's disappearance, all of it spun in my mind, a kaleidoscope of fear and confusion. I wandered the grounds, aimless and desperate, until I found myself at the edge of the clearing where the ceremony had taken place. The charred remains of the corpse lay in a heap, a stark reminder of the night's events. The ground was scorched, the grass around the effigy blackened and dead. It was a desolation that mirrored the emptiness I felt inside. As I stood there, lost in thought, a hand clapped down on my shoulder. I spun around, heart racing, to find myself face to face with a member of the Grove's security team. His expression was stern, his grip on my shoulder unyielding. You shouldn't be here, he said, his voice low and menacing. I tried to shrug off his hand to demand answers, but the words died in my throat. The look in his eyes was a clear warning. I was treading on dangerous ground. Without a word, I turned and walked away, the security guard's eyes boring into my back. The message was clear. I was being watched, my every move scrutinized. The rest of the day passed in a blur. Conversations felt strained, the laughter forced. The joy that had once permeated the grove was gone, replaced by a tension that was almost palpable. I felt eyes on me wherever I went, whispers trailing in my wake. It was clear that the ceremony was more than just a ritual. It was a test, a way to gauge one's loyalty to the grove and its secrets. And I had failed that test spectacularly. As night fell, I found myself at a crossroads. The grove, with its ancient trees, had lost its allure. The power and prestige that had once drawn me here now felt tainted, corrupted by the darkness that lay at its heart. I made my decision in the dead of night, packing my belongings with trembling hands. The thought of spending another moment in this place was unbearable. I had to leave, to escape the madness that the grove harbored. Slipping out of my cabin, I made my way to the main gate, my heart pounding in my chest. The grove was eerily silent, the only sound the crunch of gravel underfoot. I felt like a thief in the night, stealing away under the cover of darkness. The gate loomed ahead a barrier between the madness of the grove and the sanity of the outside world. I pushed it open, half expecting alarms to sound for hands to reach out and drag me back into the darkness. But there was nothing, just the quiet of the night and the open road ahead. I didn't stop walking until the first light of dawn began to creep over the horizon. The grove was behind me now a chapter of my life that I desperately wanted to close. 
but as I made my way back to the world I had left behind, I knew that some chapters refused to be closed, their pages etched with secrets that would haunt me for the rest of my days. Edward's warnings, the cremation of care, the eyes that followed me in the darkness, all of it was a part of me now, a dark stain on my soul that could never be erased. I had escaped the Bohemian Grove, but the true escape, the escape from the memories, the fear, the knowledge of what lay hidden in the heart of the forest, was a journey that had only just begun.